Um, and then I was like, you know what? Let me actually read what he wrote. He wrote quite a bit, actually. And that's actually my advice. Go and read his writings, okay? Mm. Just read a bit of them, all right? And again, by the way, I also said, I, this doesn't mean that I uphold Deng Xiaoping. I don't. I still don't. I'm still very iffy about the, the things that were changed. But looking back in hindsight and looking how far China's progressed, it looks like it was the correct um, position. Because especially when you compare it, the, the amount of progress China's made compared to Soviet um, progress of a similar time frame and similar situation, right? Hmm. Um, it's like, it's mind boggling. Um, and my, this is why, so I, I went and I read his work and I saw that he wasn't the caricature. First of all, um, again, I'm not trying to defend Deng Xiaoping, but I'm just so people are familiar with his uh, hmm. credentials. Deng wasn't just some random guy. This guy went and he, he was one of the earliest students in the Soviet Union to, that went to study Marxism, to directly study Marxism in the early Soviet period, right? Mm -hmm. I believe he went to study during the 30s or maybe even the late 20s, like really early on, right? He was a Marxist his whole life, right? When you read his writings, you don't see any inkling of, of you know, right? Mm -hmm. You don't see um, – uh, when you read them and you realize there's so much more nuance that's going on. And this was his position, really. I'm just going to distill it to the most basic thing. His mm -hmm. position was like, yes – Mao did a lot of good things. The uh, Mao air policies of industrialization were, were have built a massive industrial base for China. But this is the issue. We are isolated because of the Sino Soviet split. We're isolated from our um, like uh, ideological comrades. You know, even though there's like you know differences between, but they're isolated from them. Soviet Union was actually sanctioning parts of uh, sanctioned China. That even there were some border uh, disputes that even caused uh, the death. Of like you know uh, skirmishes that would cause the death of either Soviet soldiers or Chinese soldiers. Like this shit is insane, right? But this mm. happened, right? Uh, so they're not only are they isolated from that, but they're iso also isolated from the West and the global uh, market completely. Mm. So not only do they can they not get aid from their socialist um, like for, like fraternal you know like uh, uh, the, the socialist brotherhood you know they can't actually get help from them. Not only production whatsoever into the global market and yes china is big and yes china has lots of resources but basically what this will cause is a stillborn china there is no room left to develop really we're gonna it's, it's gonna slow it's slow until it fucking crumbles into the ground we need something new that's essentially what his idea was and this the, the, he kind of had to and by the way he didn't do this willingly this was a reluctant decision which was we ha and by the way of course it was not only him this was a massive uh, movement of millions of people that resulted in these in these decisions it wasn't just you know things but just like mao's uh, decisions weren't just mao it was movements of millions of people but yeah um what ended up the the the, the course that was taken which was by the way still reluctant was we need to open up a market not only that but we need to invite um uh like investment we need investment in in china because we're not getting it from where anywhere anywhere else and we don't we cannot do this uh what china is doing now where it's investing in itself it's because it has the um the productive forces are developed to a point where they can do this investment in, themse in themselves and still grow that was not present in china at the time before mm -hmm. right just like for example iraq right now doesn't really have room to invest within itself accumulation from maybe agricultural sectors and our oil profits then as well as in a similar situation too for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, China was in this, that situation. And you realize, okay, we'll open it. And this is another primary issue. And this was one of the fundamental issues. They lacked um, highly technical uh, machinery and ex expertise. Um, not only because not, they, it's not like they didn't have the minds for it, okay, but what they, they just didn't have access to it. And the Soviets have knocked it off. Uh, they, they, they completely stopped it. Um, so they're like, we need to get these machi We need to get this machinery from somewhere. We need to get this expertise from somewhere. This is what we'll do. We have a highly educated, trained, disciplined workforce that we can bring to the West and be like, look, we have a workforce that you don't have to pay much, and you'll get such high, pro like insane profits for yourselves. Uh, absolutely, like you know, uh, mouth watering for the capitalists. The profits they would make, hmm. but in in return, we want uh, capital investment. We want hard currency, and we want um, heavy industry uh, – not heavy industry, excuse me um, – this technical uh, expertise and, and machinery and whatnot that they didn't have and didn't have the capacity to produce at the time. And they brought it. Uh, th 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 this system up to the point where they felt that they had enough um, – 
you know, technical technical expertise of their own, and they also develop this new layer of industrial. Like it's not only an industrial base anymore. You can tell, you can, <laughs> almost as a meme, they have the industrial roof now, <laughs> right? Like they built it up. They they, they built built up a new layer of industry. Not only like, oh yeah, now we can produce coal. We we can uh, produce steel and extract coal and blah, blah blah. That's what Mao era policies did. Now the new policies, what they managed to do is like we can develop highly sophisticated computer systems. We can develop these massive. Um, uh, both military and civilian projects on city-wide scales, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can have absolutely, uh, like, a, a, what's it, cutting-edge development of, of um, microchips and, and memory and all this kind of stuff. These new things are really important for their uh, development, even back then, but especially now. They reach this point, usually, I, I would say maybe the cutoff point really is in the early 2000s, where they're like, we have enough of our own development that now we don't even really need the West that much. Like before it was a lifeline. They absolutely needed them. Now it's like, we don't really need it that much. That's why they've turned inwards, you know, 2008, nine, and around there. Um, they stopped their, the, the they, they uh, stop it, but they um, kind of refocused their development from, you know, this export based, you know, where the world's. Uh, factory to this more internal base, we have so much undeveloped uh, area, like um, uh, cities are undeveloped, things that can be developed further, new roads, new um, uh, bridges and blah, blah, infrastructure, blah, 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 the sort of stuff that happened in the United States in the early 20th century, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We'll turn our development inwards now. So because they also, they're not stupid, they know that they're going to come under, under attack from the West because of the rising economic power. So they turned inwards, which is just another layer of protection for their economic system and their stability. All of this and the modern stability of China is thanks to the still reluctantly taken uh, decision to introduce market reforms. Now, let me clarify. I don't personally think that market reforms are always their solution. No, I don't think that, um, uh, you know, oh, like we need to bring capitalism, but, but, but no, none of that shit. My entire point is that in that time, during those very precarious uh, like years um, that uh, China found itself in, this was a decision that needed to be taken even if it wasn't ideal it's what will pr uh, produce the best results for china and time has kind of proven them right um and that's kind of like a i know i'm, I'm rambling a little bit at this point but that's kind of to tie it all up it's essentially this yes so deng what he did was to introduce market reforms in order to essentially prevent what happened to the soviet union other places um primarily because of their uh, isolation globally and their isolation from their uh, socialist partners, as well as the collapse of the socialist bloc and the new um, uh, like uh, issues that were faced underneath the, you know, them as a rising superpower and whatnot. So that's just kind of it as a whole, right? And to finally reiterate, just to say, I, this does not mean I, I, I uh, uphold Deng Xiaoping. It doesn't mean like, oh, you should stick him, you know, next to the five. It should be six now. You know, it shouldn't <laughs> be like uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin now. And now Deng, I, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that people need to kind of look at him with a little more nuance. And if you really have an issue with him, don't listen to just random people on the fucking internet. Go and read his works. And at the uh, final point, yes, the Maoists have many concrete and accurate criticisms of this. All right. But you can mm -hmm. kind of you, you can see uh, the benefit in in, in uh, one side and also the other. You can look at them and get some benefit from that. And you can read the mouse critiques and get benefit from that. And hopefully, we can synthesize these positions so that in the future we can develop to an even better. That the material conditions will be helpful to us and in our favor. That's yeah. That's the answer. <laughs> Very long winded, but yeah. That was just absolutely epic. <laughs> <laughs>